I mean, I would run across people who could do some little thing really well, and I'd snap it up. But nobody ever approached the consistent successes that those three people had. And they couldn't be further apart. Uh, Pearls and Satir couldn't be in the same room together. Satir and Erickson couldn't be in the same room. She thought he was evil. Really? She said it directly. Why are you modeling an evil man? <laughs> Why would you think that? Well, I, again, who knows? If I had to make my best guess, it's pretty simple. The epistemology of the top performers in change work, the so-called psychotherapists, so that, that <coughs> there was a rule that says if you know if you know what you're doing, then you're manipulating, and manipulation by definition is bad. I mean, I don't know how you could possibly even consider being effective in the world as a change agent without being a super manipulator. That's what you are. Watch the children. They'll teach you about manipulation. They, pick, they have an intention. Boy, <laughs> they're going to get there. Um, so I, in the case of Virginia and, and Milton, Milton knew exactly what he was doing. Exactly. He actually worked out explicitly almost all of his patterning. And then as he said, he said the story to me, and then I forgot about it. And this is the same thing I'm trying to communicate to you when I say obsessive compulsive practice until it's a reflex. And then forget it. It now becomes a set of background choices you may dip into. And, I, and I'm so pleased to see people doing an exercise where they're doing XYZ and then suddenly I look over and they're using the sway signals, which is no part of that, that format. But yes it is now. They've just created a variation which it's like climbing uh, when Jeff and I go climbing. We may go climb some known route <laughs> but we can never stay on the route. Well it looks more interesting over there. Let's see if we can go over there. So we're a couple hundred feet up on the side of the wall instead of following the official route, we wander off and see if we can create a deviation. So these are all ways of trying to call to your attention the fact that success is a very dangerous situation for you. And that somehow to make these markings happen so when you reach that choice point again, you take a different exit and get some different experience. That's my hope for you. And I propose a specific strategy for doing that, namely obsessive compulsive practice of the standards. And once they're a reflex, then your job is to break them up by forgetting about the sequence. And just <coughs> doing whatever is being called for. And there is a question which I haven't made explicit, I should mention right now. It's very nice to have this question what's missing? And if, if you can answer the what's missing question, it gives you a design. Um, I receive a phone call, very wealthy family, 24 or five year old son, who when he was 11 was diagnosed, some label, some medical label, and medicated with Thorazine. Thorazine is a heavy duty drug. There's, you can go stand on a, in a mental institution ward and close your eyes and you can tell who the Thorazine patients are. They're shuffling, literally, you hear the Thorazine shuffles. It's pretty zombie stuff. So from 11, he's medicated. I have no doubt the physician, psychiatrist who prescribed the medicine had positive intentions. But positive intentions has probably killed more people on the planet than any other single source. So positive intentions are not enough. I think they're prerequisite to do the kind of work we did. But without the skill levels to back it up, you can do a lot of harm in the name of very positive goals. <coughs> in walks the mother, the father, the psychiatrist, and the young man. Um, I turn to the young man and go, I understand you're here because you want to develop choices in your present experience. Anyway, opens his mouth to say yes. But out of the void comes the voice of the mother. 
Well, you see, and she gives this two-minute description of her understanding of the problem with this sign. Uh, this is, there's a s small pause. I'm apparently watching here, but I'm actually watching this and respond to this. And then the father adds his comments, and the psychiatrist adds his. I ask the question of the kid. I didn't even leave enough space for the kid to respond. So I stand up and I look at them and I go, leave my office immediately. You could have demonstrated your incompetency once again on the simple question that I asked your son. Get out. So I throw him out of the office. Now, think about consequence here. <coughs> What's the relationship now between the kid and me? Deep rapport. He trusts me. I have said out loud what he's thought for years. These people are not competent to assist me in my difficulty. So I got deep rapport now. And then the kid gives me a gift. He says, look, my parents are wealthy. That's a problem for me. I've never worked. He said, I deeply want your assistance. I really want your help. I think something can happen here. It's the first hope I've had in a long time. But I don't want you to accept payment for your time and efforts from my, from my parents. I want you to give me a job. Give me some work. Let me work. And I mean, that in itself would probably have been enough of an intervention. But now notice, we're talking about tasking. If you know what's missing, the question immediately arises, what context can I fabricate, create, take advantage of, appropriate, whatever word? which would create the experience that fits into the gap of the answer of what's missing. So in this case, um, the kid said, please, please give me work. I go, show up here at 10 o'clock tomorrow, I'll dress smartly, smart casual, I'll have a job for you. He shows up that night, I sit down, and make up a questionnaire, customer satisfaction questionnaire. He comes in the next day, I give him 40 copies, and I go, in one week, I want these filled out. Uh, these are interviews, uh, interview forms. I want this information, I lied. I said, I have a contract with the owner of the chain, blah, blah, blah. So he goes, great, thanks so much. And he starts running. I go, where are you going? He goes, I'm going to go to the I say, do you know how to do it? <coughs> well, no. So for the next three hours, I essentially run simulations with until he could do the rapport stuff by the nonverbals, <coughs> that he knows enough of the meta model to know how to run a really good interview, um, that he has enough calibration to know when people are congruent in their response. So, a, a set of basic tools that he needed in order to do the interview. There are also a set of basic tools. Oh, he says, he confesses, he says, I know you're going to laugh, but I've only just discovered that people come in two types, men and women. And I'm fascinated by the difference. I have no idea how to approach this. He tells me this the first day, and then when he comes back, I give him these questionnaires. Now, so he's got the job. Right? And I refuse to do, and I say, I refuse to do any change work until you complete the job, because I don't want to get stuck with your bill. Acting as if. So where did I send him? <coughs> what was the chain I sent him to? Where, where did he, what stores did he stand outside of and intercept <coughs> customers leaving and do customer satisfaction interviews? Something to do with women, absolutely. It's called Victoria's Secret. <laughs> the profile is women from roughly 18 to 40, and it's kind of racy lingerie. <laughs> so it's, it's right where he his attention was anyway. Right? So what does he do? He comes back in a week and comes in with this grin on his face. He was really, he was really kind of cute. With this nice grin on his face, and uh, he confesses, you know, tries to look downfalling. I only have 20, 38 interviews, I don't have for it. Get the hell out of my office, you wasted my time. So I throw him out of the office. So he comes back the next day, and he's got 40. And it was, and then before anything can happen, he, he, he goes, I, I have something to tell you. 
I go, look. He goes, I've had two dates. <laughs> <laughs> he pauses, and this is so funny, the, the segmentation of consciousness. And he goes, can we start the change work now? <laughs> <laughs> so the form is called tasking. It's kind of a natural step if you can ask and answer the question, what's missing here? What does this person not have that if they had it would make the difference that they're seeking? It's sort of flipping the whole thing on, on the head. And in this case, the task I gave him was a buried task. His consciousness was he was earning money. I mean, he gave me the gift. He asked me to work. <coughs> said, okay, you're finished. I, I got you now. Uh, so his focus consciously was on, okay, I got to earn this before he'll do the work with me. And of course, I put him exactly in the context that I would have put him in for the intervention anyway. So, so you make sense. I mean, if I say, are you ignoring the snake under your chair? Well, first of all, he doesn't respond anymore. <laughs> but, so I'm taking advantage of just. And, but in order for uh, me to respond, yes, I'm aware, no, I'm not aware, he has to accept the reality, the presupposition. There is a snake under his chair. So um, that's a presupposition. What I did was use that same pattern, but extract it from the linguistic realm and put it in the behavior. The presupposition was he was there to make these interviews and gather these, uh, this information for his customer satisfaction <coughs> in order to earn the credit for me to do the work with him, which was, was already going on. So I, I uh, focused his attention on something which allowed him to do what he would not have otherwise been able to do, approach attractive women and engage in extended <laughs> conversations using all the rapport skills, etc., which led naturally to the smile on his face and the fact that he had two dates. To me, that, that's... Tasking is, is my preferred way of doing change work. Everything we've done here works. You need the practice to have the confidence and the experience to how to vary my behavior given <coughs> the different responses different people will make to the same pattern. That's your job, this flexibility. Um, but it sets a really nice, strong platform for then doing things like, okay, what's not here, what's missing? And figuring out how you can create a context or take advantage of one. There's a sense in which, at some point in the near future, those of you who do official coaching and so forth, I'd say get out of your office. It's the last place that change is likely to occur is in your office. Go out and do it in the street. 